Mic check one two. Mic check one two. Mic check one two. Mic. <laughs> Classic. <laughs> Published in 1915, Franz Kafka's *The Metamorphosis* is a grueling and ironic depiction of the pressures imposed by family and profession in the 20th century. The novella centers around traveling salesman Gregor Samsa, who one morning finds himself transformed into an insect. What follows, depending on the interpretation, is a reflection of how modern life provides a misunderstanding of predicaments and lack of empathy towards those who have been beaten down by an unforgiving capitalist system. Equally, the metamorphosis asks questions for Gregor himself. Over time, he has continued to disregard his own well-being and autonomy, seeing himself as a savior of his family's debts. Yet, by doing so, he has missed the fact that his family appear to resent the house he has chosen to rent, or that their debts are not quite as bad as they seemed. He has taken a cross which he need not have bared. In the word of Vladimir Nabokov, in the metamorphosis, contrast and unity, style and matter, manner and plot are most perfectly integrated. As always, a huge thank you to Cullum St. Gabriel's and all of our patrons who support the show. If you head over to patreon.com forward slash pansycast, you can pledge your support and get yourself pre-releases of all our episodes, exclusive access to the Pansycast after show, and access to our monthly live Q&A sessions. For the last 120 weeks without fail, we have gifted your ears with a weekly dosage of philosophy. So please consider supporting us on Patreon so we can bring you 120 more. Hello and welcome to episode 55 of the Pansai Cast. I'm the alienated Jack Symes. I'm joined once again by the bedbug who's always late for work, Mr. Andrew Horton. Hello. And the man we all fear when we step into our bedrooms, Mr. Holly <laughs> Hello. Happy February 10th to you both. How are your Januaries? Any exciting news? And how are the wedding preparations going? Andrew, have you tried any more Greg's sausage rolls? That's, uh, yeah, I have the, in preparation for my wedding, I'm going to have vegan sausage rolls as the main course, Jack. That's what I've decided on now after trying your wonderful uh, taster that you gave me. Uh, <laughs> in a, <laughs> in a horse, yeah, in a, that sounds really odd. <laughs> Take two. Uh, the, the, the actual preparations, yeah, we're, get, we're getting there. Uh, as I've, I need to still finalize the suit, but uh, I'm planning on doing that in the next couple of weeks. And the, obviously, venue, all the food sorted. Uh, so the, I'm sure you'll get some sort of vegan uh, <laughs> meal out there, Jack. Ollie, you can have a real meal. Thanks. <laughs> Yeah, January was a good month for me too. It was, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm just going to move off this awful topic. January was a good month for me too. It was my birthday, so I'm now a year older, wiser, Happy birthday, more mature. Ollie. On behalf of all the listeners. Much more grizzled and handsome. How old are uh, you now, Ollie? Oh, I can't say that. <laughs> I can't tell you my age, Andrew. It's a mystery. Uh, it's my birthday as well, guys. I don't care. <laughs> Who? <laughs> yeah. What? Uh, you like oh, sorry, was someone without a beard talking? <clears throat> on that, I still haven't grown one. Uh, but I will be meaning to. On that note, though, talking of people with lovely beards, if I was turned into an insect and was locked away in my room forever, I wouldn't mind as long as I had Lily Hooper in my life. Lily, from the bottom of our hearts, on behalf of all of our listeners, thank you for supporting the show. Thanks, Lily. It says everyone thanks Lily after on the piece of paper. <laughs> thanks, Lily. <laughs> Who's the most amazing human being on the face of the planet? Why, it's Jim Clare, Jack, and he's such a lovely and generous person. He has a wonderfully beautiful beard, and he, he has a great sweet hum of his car. That's a reference that little to no one is going to get other than Jim. We need to break down. So, um, <laughs> patrons, people who support the show on Patreon, thank you so much for your support, especially Lily and Jim, who um, are, are big donators. Um, Jim joined us for one of the live discussion and Q&As, and... And he was travelling in his car at the time, and it uh, sounded wonderful. Which means you can do pan psychast on the move as well. I imagine many people do. I wonder how many people sit down and listen like they would. You know, you see on the television adverts, people listening to like BBC Radio 4 lying on their sofa at home. I wonder how many people actually just sit there and listen to the radio rather than out and about. Let us know on Twitter if you're just listening to the pan psychast relaxing at home. I know I do my ironing to podcasts, so, you know, that's what do I'm you? doing. Is that what you do? Yeah. You listen to this on a Sunday and do your ironing? Yeah. Oh, wonderful. Well, 
If you're as alienated as Jim and Lily and you want to support the show, head over to patreon.com forward slash pansycast or hit the link in the iTunes description. Knowing me, knowing Andrew, uh uh-huh, there is nothing he can do. Knowing me, knowing Andrew. So we're going to find out more about Andrew. I did not sign up for this before beginning this recording. That's why in the lyrics it says there's nothing you can do. And next time we'll do one for Ollie. Oh, lovely. And then we'll do one for you, Jack. Yeah, that'll be a good one. So I've spent the last few months working away on something very special. It's my Mm -hmm. super duper personality (laughs) computer. (laughs) Whoa. So what I do is I input your information and what it does is it tells us which Franz Kafka metamorphosis character you are. So just give us your answers in a sentence. What is a human being? A human being is somebody who is from the <laughs> Homo, spe- Homo sapien uh, species uh, who has some level of eye. You know what, Jack? This is rubbish. That's not, good. That's, <laughs> it's a Homo sapien. <laughs> what happens when you die? You rot in the ground. What is the purpose of life? Uh, I'll go down the uh, existentialist route here and say something cheesy like, whatever you make it, or whatever rubbish that is. (laughs) (laughs) That's dreadful. You just say the point and then slander it in the same sentence. (laughs) And how do we know what's right or wrong? Uh, It's all... I'll go down the, um, uh, the Nietzsche route here and just say, it's all just made up, man. You ruined my joke. Okay, let me, uh, I'll put this through the personality super duper computer. Okay, it says here that you're the 18th century German Enlightenment philosopher Immanuel Kant. <laughs> Which is... I think there's something wrong with your machine, Jack. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we'll try it again next time. Sorry about that. That was a bit of a, a, bit of a waste of time. <laughs> That was really bad. Like, Man, I, really hope- I did not want to do it. I gave bad answers to bad questions. I really hope you're not listening to this for the first time, because it gets much better than this, I promise. Uh, it does. In our listener question segment, there's still not a jingle for listener questions, if there wasn't one there. Um, just the one today I thought would ask from Jackal Albult from the UK. I assume that's a username. If you could be any animal, what animal would it be and why? It's directed at me, but... Um, I'll, I guess I'll answer last. Uh, Ollie, if you were an animal, what would it be and why? Ooh. Um, I guess the animal that I think probably... You want to pick an animal that doesn't have any predators, right? So that's quite difficult, I guess, in the one sense, because humans kind of kill a lot of different kinds of species of animal. I don't know, maybe like a, like a shark. That'd be kind of cool. You wouldn't yeah. have to fear anything apart from other sharks, and you could just kind of eat what you want. That'd be, that'd be all right. Or even like, I don't know, maybe like a one of those massively like 150-year-old sea turtles. That'd be cool, because you can swim around and be quite chill. <laughs> and he's looking at me like, what is this? <laughs> like, why, why is this going on? That's, that's a good answer, Ollie. So you'd be a shark, Andrew? Uh, I am. I like, like dolphins. They seem playful, mm. and they have fun, and they're smart, and, and obviously have great wit. Uh, the... <laughs> I'm not going to say it. <laughs> uh sea otters are awesome i like oh, i like cool. them uh and also uh i'm i'm partial to the bonobos as well hmm. they're they are great apes i would be a bug which is a great segue <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. so we're looking at franz kafka's 1915 novel the metamorphosis this episode so for the first time we're doing some philosophy of literature uh, this was very much inspired by Andrew's suggestion. So if this goes horribly wrong, you it's can direct any complaints you want to. It's uh, either or 16 on Twitter if you <laughs> wanted to send him some hate mail. Uh, but it, I presume it'll go very well. Praise in that direction as well. Do you want to uh, tell us why we're doing the metamorphosis? What's the inspiration? Why are we looking at it? Well, I mean, I, I decided to read this maybe, yeah, maybe even closer to a year ago now. Uh, and I... I I just thought that it's one of those books, and if you've read it yourself, you'll you'll know exactly w- why. It, it, it's it's so easy to kind of delve deeper into it if you want to. There's loads of great themes, and you can interpret it in, well, I mean, we'll get to it later, but there's like 130 different like recognized interpretations, but definitely more than that now. Uh, in which case, it's just, it's one of those novels that's perfect for philosophical discussion Mm -hmm. and we wanted to kind of uh spend a bit of time looking at different novels as well as just looking at philosophical texts um mainly because it just 
the texts are far more interesting just to kind of go through and enjoy it for what it is. Some some philosophy takes a bit more time to just really take your time over and and mull over and and the the writing is just not nearly as interesting. So this is just a great opportunity for us to be able to continue to do the podcast justice uh, and in a slightly different way. So yeah, I thought it would be interesting. Yeah, we're very aware that the majority of people don't have the time to sit and read philosophical texts. A lot of them are very, very dense. A lot of them have very, very hard to understand ideas. And we like kind of taking some of those ideas and those texts and breaking them down and hopefully making them easier to understand hopefully not harder anyway um, and I think novels are a really good way in for people um, especially young people or people that have kind of a fleeting interest in philosophy you know if I met someone that was like I don't know anything about philosophy what do you think would be a good way in I would say well if you enjoy reading stories which I think most people would like I would like to say most people like stories it's one of the oldest form of communication we have then reading a, a novella like the metamorphosis is a really good way in because it will tell you a lot about yourself in a sense you know if you have big questions and if you're thinking deeply about it then philosophy might be something that you are interested in because that's what philosophy is about. It's about kind of digging deeper and finding themes and kind of figuring things out. And I think the metamorphosis, because it's quite short and because it's got mm. a really a core idea, core ideas, sorry, in the set, in the middle of it, which are kind of, I think anyone from any culture or any gender or any kind of society can get something from. I think it's a really, really good entry point. So, you know, if we're going to look at, you know, the the... Uh, philosophical ideas in literature i think it's an it's an excellent starting point um and it's a, and it's just a really good book you know it's just arguably one of the most influential um and important 20th century novels um so the fact that we get to discuss it is going to be great um and if you're someone who listens to the podcast and hasn't really read any philosophical texts it might be a nice way into some of those themes it's only 60 pages long as well so not just for the listener i guess because we're you know we work full-time in addition to doing the podcast and an enormous amount of work goes into researching for interviews as Simone de Beauvoir in each episode they take they're really really taxing and although we love doing them it's just not possible to do that all year round so for the first time since we've been doing this show we've just focused on a short text um, so we'll see how it goes and I think I've really really enjoyed it I'm looking forward to talking about it getting through the plot and some some classic pan story time as well so if you really enjoy it when we read the stories and you like our bad accents then um you'll love this <laughs> and if, <laughs> and if you, you don't, don't yeah then you'll hate this ah, <laughs> give this one a miss but... <laughs> oh wait no sorry uh, uh give us patreon money <laughs> Part 1. The Life of Franz Kafka So unlike our Simone de Beauvoir and Nietzsche episodes, we're not going to give a massively detailed account of Kafka's life. We're going to give you a whistle-stop tour choo -choo, of all the key things in Kafka's life that you need to know. What's that look for? It's just daft and it's funny to so keep it in. It's just daft. <laughs> it's, a, it's just <laughs> being daft. <laughs> in other words, it was bad. Tech. And the car goes beep, beep. <laughs> And a the cow, cow goes, goes no. <laughs> what is this? <laughs> so, who was Franz Joseph Kafka? Jack, Ollie and Andy investigate. So, born in 1883, uh, Franz Kafka uh, was born in Prague to a very middle-class Jewish family. At the time in Prague, there was a very large Jewish population. His parents were both Jews, and I don't think he very much enjoyed going to the synagogue as a child, but he was a practicing Jew during his uh, younger years. I think he had his bar mitzvah at the age of 13 and so on. Um, his parents are probably the most interesting thing and something we'll focus on when we're looking at the meaning of the metamorphosis. Often Kafka's work is compared as kind of a a confession maybe or a rumination on his difficult relationship with his mother and father. His parents are Herman and Julie Kafka. His mother's the daughter of a rich merchant and his father the son of a, a ritual slaughterer. So and when I say ritual slaughterer, I mean someone who... Um, prepares food for Jews in the traditional kosher fashion. 
So that's that was his dad's role. And his mother was the better educated of both of them. And his mother would work like 12 hours a day in the family business. But his dad also was a very hardworking man, very authoritarian and really quite abusive as well. I just want to give a short little insight into that. Um, I think it's safe to say he was psychologically abusive and unloved and unsupported Kafka by his father. And I don't think he thought his father ever cared about the suffering he was causing him. I can't remember how many pages it is in total, but there's a great long piece of work. I want to say it's about 100 pages long. I'll double check in a moment. He writes this great big long letter to his father before he dies. So when Kafka was a young boy, he called out for water for his father. And his father came into the room, dragged him out of bed, threw him onto the balcony and shut the door, left him there to freeze during the night. Not freeze to death, but he was really cold and just in his nightwear. And Kafka recalls this in his letter to his father. I was quite obedient afterwards at that period, but it did me inner harm. What was for me a matter of course, that senseless asking for water and the extraordinary terror of being carried outside were two things that I, my nature being what it was, could never properly connect with each other. Even years after I suffered from the tormenting fancy that the huge man, my father, the ultimate authority, would come almost for me no reason at all and take me out of bed in the night and carry me onto the balcony. And that meant I was a mere nothing to him. Yep, that is very, very upsetting really, isn't it? I mean, the, for, a, for a child to be to desperately need help and i think it sounds as if kafka was quite a, like an awkward and misunderstood child and he just wanted someone his and i guess his father here being the the highest authority in the family to just notice him for who he was and to actually build him up to say kind words to him where he like can and be able to see that actually he might be able to grow into somebody more impressive yet his father shut him out completely and and not only that, yeah, as, as Jack said, I mean, I think we can say now quite safely, this seems to be quite psychologically abusive towards him. And this had a profound effect on how he saw himself throughout his entire life. And if we look at his life, it's very interesting that whatever Kafka did, it just never seemed to be enough for Herman, um, for his father. Um, you know, Kafka is someone who from a, from quite a young age clearly has this impulse to write, to create. He seems quite artistically minded, and that seems to be his passion. So much so that, you know, it might be something he'd want to do for a living. But his father almost kind of completely not only just rejects that, but completely ignores it. So in a sense, kind of encourages him and in a sense, kind of forces him to kind of study a similar uh, life to himself. So Kafka goes to university. He studies law in 1906. And it's very interesting that kind of he, he's forced into a line of work, which he spends his whole life in, which is insurance. So he works for an insurance company in Prague for pretty much his entire life until he's pensioned in 1922. And Kafka's obviously an author, so he's working full time. Well, when does he write? Uh, he writes at night. He writes alone. And he writes clearly, you know, if you, if you read his writing, it's very personal. It's very, uh, you know, uh, deep and, and got lots of kind of definitely a lot of thought behind mm. it. But you can definitely see that, you know, this is clearly something that, that Kafka wanted to do. And his father kind of declined. I've got another quote here, which I think is quite interesting, which is um, when Kafka apparently pr produced a book that he'd, he'd uh, been successfully published for to his father, his father dismissed him and just said, like, put it on the bedside table. Like, I don't even want to read it. Can you can imagine, right? So if you're, you know, if you produce some work you're really proud of and it gets published, I mean, that's amazing, especially, you know, in the early 20th century. And then to have your, your relative completely or your, your father completely just reject you like that must mm. be must be horrible and i've got another quote here which is about when kafka told his uh, father that he wished to be engaged um, and this is from from his letter so this is a quote from his father she should probably put on an exquisite blouse as only prague jewishness know how to do whereupon you naturally decided to marry her as quickly as possible within a week tomorrow today i don't understand you you are an adult. You live in a town and yet insist on marrying the first woman who comes along. Is there no alternative? If you're afraid, I'll go with you to a brothel. So we have a really heartless response to Kafka's, you know, you know, sincerely saying, I want to marry this woman. And his father being like, well, she's just the first woman you've met. Maybe you should go to a brothel and try out some other people, um, which, you know, even to the modern ears seems very harsh. Um, and, you know, just this complete lack of empathy. Or mm. I think that uh, one of the introductions to the book I read explained it really clearly where it said that it's, it's not like a um, like an, a, an active abuse. It's kind of like a 
like a negligence like yeah. Kafka's father just literally doesn't communicate doesn't care um, and that in a sense it's kind of like this mutual non-communication which comes up in, in the Metamorphosis book as well where Kafka clearly just stops trying after a while to please his father and stops having that relationship with him yeah. and that's definitely reciprocated by both of them I think yeah uh, on that point because it's particularly with the quote you just read there it kind of it, his dad seems to imply that Kafka is uh, is just this desperate man mm. who who just takes what he can get like the scraps as it were and he ha and he just hasn't got any agency and yeah you can see the parallels there between gregor and his father in the book as well um so you, you do wonder how much of the story is kind of a uh, kind of autobiographical uh, in its in its way whether that's probably not the only way to look at it probably the most powerful thing i read so it's a hundred pages long this letter to his father an extraordinary tome and he gave it to his mother to give to his father and after reading a few pages a couple of weeks later she returned it to france and she said you know your, your work your father worked so hard he should never have to read this it would destroy him and then he never had the confidence to to give it him again and a Probably the most powerful thing in there was him reflecting on changing with his father in, in a bathing hut. And a small quote here was, There was I, skinny, weakly, slight, you strong, tall, broad. Even inside the hut, I felt a miserable specimen. And what's more, not only in your eyes, but in the eyes of the whole world. And I just, that really hit me hard, just in this confession to his father and he's always saying in there it's not your fault dad that i feel this way i know you can't control the way you are but kafka's just yeah, it's the angst it's the suffering it's the misery and it really comes out in this letter to his father so he's the eldest of six we should note it and although his life is very miserable he contemplates suicide numerous times it's been speculated by psychologists since that he had a severe eating disorder and he certainly wanted to end his life in 1912 but he didn't end his life but his family were also he's very close to his sisters he had five other siblings his two brothers died in infancy before he was born and his sisters Gabrielle, Valerie and Ottilie all were uh, murdered in the holocaust after Franz's death. So as Ollie said, he worked in an insurance company for a while and he eventually left the insurance company and worked for as an insurance officer. And his job enabled him to leave at two o'clock where he'd do most of his writings afterwards. And as Ollie said, he, he grows quite ill, doesn't he? What what happens to him? Why, why does he well, this this combination of you know working in this insurance company full time and kind of spending a lot of his evenings writing eventually leads him to develop tuberculosis. Um, he eventually gets so poorly that he gets taken into a care home, um, which he eventually dies. Um, I mean, it's worth saying as well. I think that you know, kind of tying all this stuff together, I, I kind of think it's worth mentioning as well that we've mentioned quite a bit about um, Franz Kafka's father, but also his mother's role in this as well. So you know, um, this is kind of expressed in the book as well that his mother kind of lets this happen or doesn't stop this from happening as mm. well that you know Franz Kafka and one of the main themes of this book is the idea of alienation or kind of estrangement or you know inadequacy um, and you we can we can connect several things to this you know whether the father figure is definitely one part of it but we, we've got to remember as well that Kafka is a German he's a German Jew who lives in the in the Czech Republic or in Czechoslovakia at the time so he is a, a minority he is um, very much you know an outsider maybe the word we could use um, and a lot of uh, German Jews at that time would kind of distance themselves from Judaism uh, and be kind of a little less uh, you know orthodox Jewish to kind of fit more in with the Czech society so Kafka's in this really interesting position where he's he's not quite working class but he's not quite middle class um, he's not quite Czech but he's not really quite German mm. he's kind of Jewish but not kind of a hundred percent he's and that's fine if he had like a really loving supporting family but then you you kind of throw in the fact that you know, his father's clearly quite abusive. So you, you end up with an individual who is working incredibly hard, who's trying everything they can. And whatever they are doing, he just can't quite fit in. He can't quite mm. get the sense of belonging or identity. Um, and I think that that is definitely something that comes across in a lot of his work, not just the metamorphosis. Um, and I think that context is really important for the book and our analysis of it, because that understanding of him being kind of isolated and out of time um, will definitely pop up later when we talk about the book in detail.
Just to rewind a little bit here. Um, so at university, he became friends with some great influential thinkers such as Felix Welsh and Max Broad. And Kafka would read loads. But with Max, he would read quite a lot of classical philosophy, one of their favourites being Plato. Then so Felix, Max and Kafka would come to be known as the close Prague circle, as they called themselves, as they read and wrote later into their lives. Max um, noted that Kafka was tortured by sexual desire, a theme which might come up later on. And Kafka would regularly visit brothels. He would uh, he had a little bit of an obsession with pornography and noted just how miserable uh, that Kafka was during his life. But it should be noted that he meets a woman when he's about 28, uh, Felice Boer, and he meets her at Brod's home. Um, Max's home and after he met her he, he goes through this massive period of just this burst of being able to write huge amounts and his first book The Judgment is written literally in one night um, after he meets this woman. Should we talk a bit about some of Kafka's texts that he writes throughout his life and their context? Sure, yes. Yeah. So we've got The Meditation in 1913, which again, these are these are all mainly short stories. We've got The Stoker, a fragment, which is also published in 1913. Um, you know, so we've got two stories in one year. We've got The Metamorphosis in 1915. The Sentence in 1916, a, uh, a Country Doctor, Little Tales in 1919, and In the Penal Colony in 1919 as well. So for this kind of four-year period, he's very, very prolific. Um, and this raises a very interesting question because uh, Kafka wrote more books than this. Um, he wrote other books such as The Castle and The Trial, um, which mm. are kind of today seen as his kind of big works. Yeah. Um, you know, His longer works is more, maybe more influential. But not many people are aware that these works were actually, well, not published and Kafka, when he died, kind of instructed Max to not publish them at all, that mm. preferably, in his own words, that they should be destroyed unread. Now, I guess, fortunately for us, Max read them, thought they were really, really good, and decided, you know, um, after after Kafka had died, to, to publish them. And now they're seen as, you know, really influential and, and interesting works. Um, but it just, yeah, sometimes it's really interesting, isn't it? You think of these people like, yeah. oh, just publishing these books. But actually, if it hadn't been for this one individual, those works would have been completely destroyed and, and would have disappeared forever. I think it's just a testament just how miserable or unsatisfied Kafka was. Even with the thing he loved the most, he just didn't want anyone to read it. He felt so inadequate. And there's a brilliant stories about how, um, you know, Max goes off with the papers and they're confiscated by the Cascapo during World War Two. And they eventually come back and have been published. And people are obviously very pleased with the trial, the castle and America is is full length novels never actually completed. Metamorphosis was completed. And um, but he did burn around 90 percent of his work and he didn't. We wanted it all burned. And. There's a wonderful quotation from his will here, um, which is written to his friends, Max. Dearest Max, my last request, everything I leave behind me in the way of diaries, manuscripts, letters, my own and others, sketches and so on, is to be burned unread. But at the same time, that's quoted a lot of the time. But what people fail to quote in the, the reading I've done around this is, a, is another extract from uh, Kafka, which says, of all my writings, the only books that can stand are these, The Judgment, The Stoker and Metamorphosis, Penal Connolly, Country Doctor and the short story Hunger Artist. When I say that those five books and the short story can stand, I do not mean that I wish them to be reprinted and handed down posterity. On the contrary, should they disappear altogether, that would be pleased me best. Only since they do exist, I do not wish to hinder anyone who may want to from keeping them. He's saying, I really don't want you to read them, but you know, you've got them now anyway. So these five, I guess, if we're going to say some are okay, <laughs> yeah. I'm glad we picked the metamorphosis so he'd be a little bit pleased with us. Well, probably not. But I guess what's really interesting about this is uh, kind of the psyche of a, of a writer that is why someone would choose to write in the first place. Mm -hmm. and, and I think Franz Kafka is one of these ones, or it appears to be at least just by by those letters, that he, he might have been writing a lot more for himself than anybody else. And that these things were just an exploration of thoughts that perhaps he never felt like he could share with other people and that, or, or at least maybe his closest friends. And then, yeah, he was quite happy for that to be it. Mm. And that and the, any fame or anything that came from that, maybe it, it was just a product of his low self-esteem, but he, yeah, he was quite happy just to write what he wanted to write and leave it at that. Yeah, they're not autobiographical books, but certainly, you know, if, if you are aware of, you know, the outlines of his life, which we've outlined for you, yeah, the you read these books and you're like, oh, yeah, okay, I kind of see mm. what's going on here. Which ultimately, I guess, why people like them so much. He's not trying to make a, like a commentary on anything else other than his own experience, mm. which therefore means that because he's not 
like trying to write a literary masterpiece, it ends up that way anyway. Um, so I guess that's sort of maybe a, an encouragement to any young writers out there. Maybe focus on what you want to write about and not worrying about exactly what the people at your time are desperate to read. Perhaps we haven't mentioned just how influential Kafka's been. He's known as one of the greatest writers of the 20th century, but no one, as Andrew said, was reading him at the time, apart from that close Prague circle with his two other friends. And in terms of metamorphosis, which is our, obviously our topic and what we'll be moving on to in part two, it was around this time when he met Felice Boyle where he started writing on it. And so it's on November 17th, he wrote to his fiance um, that he was working on the story and that came to me in the misery lying in bed and was now haunting him and three weeks later he'd finished it so though it'd be another three years before that story saw print so that one was published metamorphosis and um, he read the first section to his two friends in november and again in that december and eventually it was published now at the end of his life he's got this miserable life of inadequacy in relation to his father this oppressive authoritarian father that's inflicting all this suffering and all this psychological damage on him and then towards the end of his life as ollie said he gets tuberculosis which means it's excruciatingly painful for him to eat or swallow anything and he eventually dies from this there's this brilliant short story um the hunger artist or a hunger artist which he mentions is one of those five books and it's probably only five six pages long so i recommend i'll put it in the description on the website to list uh, to give that a read um just a really brief synopsis because i think it just brings the end of kafka's life in that self biographical way so there's this hunger artist and he stands in this cage and he starves himself for the people and the first time he does this he spends 40 days standing there and starving hopping back to the story of jesus or something like this um, and all the parents love it they're celebrating it and eventually um, he comes down and people start to lose a bit of interest then he moves to a circus and he goes in a cage next to some animals and he started i guess not enjoying it he becomes more and more depressed because he gets a different kind of reception there so he was there for a long time and then towards the end of the story this one person stops and there's obviously a board out the front which counts the days which the hunger artist's been there and a quote from the story here and when once in a while some leisurely passerby stopped made merry of the old figure on the board and spoke swindly that was in its way the stupidest lie ever invented by indifference and inborn malice. Since it was not the hunger artist who was cheating, he was working honestly, but the world had cheated him of his reward. This man stops and makes a joke saying, oh, you must be a fraud, you're a liar. And the hunger artist has spent his whole life trying to be this thing for someone else just to put him down. So he leaves the cage, um, he goes out into some straw and there he dies and he says, to this person in front of him. It was really easy for me to suffer in this way. It came naturally to me. You've all applauded for me for doing it in this way. But actually, it was really simple. And they leave him there to die and replace his cage. They put a panther in his cage, this great big entertaining beast which the crowds then love. And I just think there's so many, as you can tell, knowing the life of Kafka, which we've just given, there's some brilliant themes there. So we highly recommend giving that a read as um, something to parallel with his life. And we will do with the metamorphosis as well. That's nice and cheery, isn't it? Should we cheer up a little bit? <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> yeah. What, what can we do to cheer up? I'm sure you've got a great game for us to play, Jack. Is it one in which <laughs> involves sarcastic. some kind of mystery? Jack is always sarcastic. <laughs> philosopher. And that's a wonderful segue into the jingle there. Thanks for that, Ollie. That's the mystery <laughs> philosopher. Ding, 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 the mystery philosopher i remember while i was at school some of my muslim friends talked about a handful of people spoiling things in every culture hatred or hurt or pain isn't specific to the religion i think it's a matter of acceptance the one thing the world is to accept is everybody is different what is normal to us is different and unusual to somebody else it's a difficult one. If you're wondering why the voice sounds weird, it's not me. It's our old friend Daniel, who used to do the outros for the podcast, the robot voice, and it's just muffled. I remember while I was at school, some of my Muslim friends talked about a handful of people spoiling things in every culture. Hatred or hurt or pain isn't specific to a religion. I think it's a matter of acceptance. The one thing the world has to accept is everybody is different. What is normal to us is different and unusual to somebody else. I'm really sorry in advance for when there are big reveals here because it's really difficult, isn't it? I'll give you a final clue in part four, but do you want to have a go? Is it someone we've interviewed? It's not, is it? 
No comment? Uh, no clues for, for part one? Uh, I have no idea, but I'm going to go with Rebecca Goldstein. No, it's not Rebecca Goldstein. No. And Andy? I, no, I, I'm not even going to give a guess. I have no idea. That There's difficult. literally nothing. It is hard. It's yeah. a really difficult one. It's just because I didn't want to make loads of quotes and have to go through them all. So I just went for a difficult... You get them too easily these days. I nearly you've made one of one of your own voices, but I think you'll recognise them. Ooh. No, it's not one of your own voices. <laughs> oh, <damn it. laughs> Great. So I'm, I was thinking about uh, taking this road show uh, where I'm going to be locked in a cage. And I'm going to... Road show? Yeah, just uh, like a... Or, touring carnival where I'd, i will I'd be... pay to watch that yeah i guess what my do you think the audience would still prefer the canty and cafe <laughs> <laughs> well both of them are going to be as void and <laughs> meaningless as because that's a pretty usual. elaborate plan to get out no, of finishing okay, the canty and cafe <laughs> can we can we yeah i'm gonna starve myself to death to get out of my contract <laughs> Thank you for joining us for another episode of the Pan Sai Cast. The next instalment of this episode will be available on the following Monday. Patreon subscribers already have access to the latest episode of the Pan Sai Cast. To support the show and get early access to all of the episodes, you can visit us on Patreon. That's www.patreon.com forward slash Pan The link is also in the iTunes description. For all the reading and to find out more about the show and get all of the old episodes completely free, you can visit www.thepansycast.com. From all of us here at The Pansycast, thank you for your support and thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. It's been lots of fun. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for listening. Thank you all. I've enjoyed it a lot. Thanks a lot. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. I really appreciate what you folks are trying to do. That's that was that great. One. That was really good. Great. You guys really read up on this. Yeah, it was good. Wow. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. You guys uh, managed to combine the banter and the philosophy perfectly, I think. Beautiful. Fantastic. Great. Oh, well done, you guys. Gosh, you're yeah. doing a wonderful thing with this. <laughs>